All right, let me uh, convene us. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, for those I don't know, I'm Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of School of Public Health at Boston University, and welcome to today's Public Health Forum. Uh, these uh, Public Health Fora are our monthly opportunities to discuss and tackle big ideas, and today, I think we're actually tackling an idea that lies at the heart of one of our core values, diversity. To my mind, diversity is core to academic public health. In our school, we have a diversity and inclusion statement where we affirm, quote, fostering diversity and inclusion is essential to fulfilling our mission as an academic public health institution. As I've said many times before, I actually don't think we can be a leading school of public health without reflecting the many backgrounds, perspectives that create a diverse community. We have pursued this goal in many ways at the, at the school. We've been mindful that the work of diversity is never done, and we have done a number of things, including relaunching our diversity and inclusion website, our continued efforts to promote the language of inclusion in our community, events like SPH Reads, which was yesterday, our diversity and inclusion seminar series, our efforts to recruit faculty from all different aspects of life, and events like today. Much of this has been overseen by our Assistant Dean of Diversity and Inclusion, Yvette Cozier, and I want to thank her for a moment for everything that she's done on this front. Today, we have a guest who's one of the leading voices on the importance of diversity in academic communities. And he's going to tackle an issue that, to my mind, looms large over any effort to make a school as diverse and inclusive as possible. Dr. Claude Steele is a social psychologist, professor of psychology at Stanford. He has written extensively on how stereotype threat shapes the academic performance of minority students. He summarized this research in his book, Whistling Vivaldi, and other clues to how stereotypes affect us. For those of you who haven't read it, it's a terrific book. He has received really any honor there is. He is elected to the American Academy of Arts and Science, National Academy of Sciences, National Science Board, National Academy of Education, and the American Philosophical Society. He has also served in several major academic leadership positions, such as the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, University of California, Berkeley, the James Quillen Dean for the School of Education at Stanford, and the 21st Provost of Columbia University, where I first had the privilege of meeting Dr. Steele. I have learned a lot from Dr. Steele, both in our interactions and in reading his work, and I'm very much looking forward to his presentation. Claude. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here in Boston. And so, it's, I think this is the warmest day I've ever been here in Boston. <laughs> so I, I'm going to interpret it as in my honor. Um, maybe if I stand over here, you can still hear me because the microphone uh, works. So, um, well, I, I would like to talk uh, about a, a problem that sort of comes from both my research and from my experience as an administrator, which is uh, how do you have a, uh, I'll call it successfully diverse community? How do you make a diverse community really work so that uh, everybody in it is able to take advantage of its opportunities and all of the riches therein, uh, unencumbered by their identities? where their identities are not ignored, but they're not encumbered by them. That would be, I suppose, in a sense, the American uh, ideal. Uh, so I've been thinking about that, and that's what I want to tell you guys about uh, today. Um, I, I think the focus uh, is really if, in, at the level of institutions. I, I'm, I'm not uh, ambitious enough to take on all of society in, in one uh, uh, proposal, but I, I do think, so what I'm aiming for are institutions like schools, like classrooms, hospitals, corporations, businesses. Uh, in those sort of containable environments where we have an opportunity to, to uh, and I won't be shy about this term, to engineer them a little bit, is there a way to do it so that uh, diversity works for everybody? Um, this is not to, I, I'm not going to uh, make a, a speech about the value of a diversity. I'm going to assume we're all going to, we've all heard that speech uh, and understand how important it is. I, I can't, I, I think it's really one of the core strengths of American society is that we've had so many diverse experiences from so many different peoples to draw on to form a society that, that it, it's been maybe underappreciated, but it is at the core of our strength as a nation. Um, so I feel that strongly about it. Uh, but I also feel it's a necessity uh, uh, in, in, in going forward. How do you, the, the, coming to some terms about how you handle a problem like this is a, is a necessity. Uh, I, I hope in the course of the talk that uh, I can, you know, make it clear why I think it's important. I'm going to go out on a limb at a certain point and explain what I think is critical to making it work, what the at least the conceptual answer uh, is, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you do it. So 
uh, we'll get practical uh, before <laughs> the, the, the afternoon is, uh, is, is over. Uh, my own thinking starts, I guess, with the recognition that this is a, uh, we are really, as a society, in transition toward being a much more diverse society than we have been. And it is a process that's taking place at a pretty rapid rate. In 1970, probably 82% of the population was white. Uh, today, it's about 63% of the population. By 2040, it'll be about a um, little less than 50%. By 2050, less than that. So uh, for a variety of reasons, birth, birth rates, differential birth rates, group birth rates, immigration, a whole variety of things, uh, we're becoming a much more diverse society uh, than we have been. And the, the question is, uh, uh, how do our institutions uh, handle this diversity? And are they set up to handle this diversity? Uh, I'm going to really raise questions about whether our pedagogy uh, from K through, let's say, 16 or 22, I don't know what the number would be, but all the way through our school system, uh, our schooling systems, uh, do we have the pedagogies to really deal with this diversity? And that I'm going to try to uh, problematize that a little bit in, uh, in today's talk, but it starts out with that fact. Uh, the next thing uh, we, I, I want to say is that we have had a model, an American model for doing this. Uh, having a diverse society. We're not without uh, guidance. Um, we have a, what I've been calling a kind of assimilation, uh, identity blind approach to handling diversity in our institutions, in our classrooms, our businesses, uh, and, the, and the like. Uh, it, it, I, I, sh I should say, uh, at least in my experience, I think this model came into real um, to started to take real shape probably in the mid 60s if I'm using my own life as a, there could have been an era where it was around before then but I, I don't think so. Uh, it, it, as the uh, Supreme Court des desegregated our schools and as the Civil Rights Voting Act was signed and the Civil Rights Bills, that period uh, kind of launched our society uh, on a project of integration that we are going to integrate the society. Uh, we're not going to tr we're not try to have separate parallel uh, societies for each group. It's too complicated. It's not moral, and uh, for all kinds of reasons, we are going to to do this. So we launched ourselves on an integration project, if I can uh, uh, call it that. And I think our general operating model for how to do that is that um, look, uh, if I'm a member of the enfranchised group. I would say, I'm going to be, trust me, I'm going to be identity blind. I'm going to be color blind. I'm going to be identity blind. Uh, I'm going to treat you as an individual. I'm going to see you that way. And your job is to assimilate to the mainstream, its standards and ways of life, values, etc., kind of as fast as you can. And then we can sort of get on with this. The future will look uh, uh, like a, a, an assimilated future in which a lot of di people from different kinds of backgrounds have assimilated to the mainstream standards of uh, society. And uh, I remember in the mid-60s as a pretty young guy at that uh, time that that was an exciting idea because up until that time in my life, um, somebody born in the 40s, uh, things had been very segregated uh, and, and the doors weren't open. And there really wasn't an integration uh, uh, project uh, afoot. And life was very sternly uh, segregated in the South and in the North. And uh, so this idea seemed simple, digestible, and like it would be a humane moral guide forward. So um, now we've had uh, a considerable amount of time to experience that model. And I, I think in some profound and important ways, it's, it hasn't worked. It, or at least it work, hasn't worked in the way to the degree that we'd like, like it to work. I can't really say that it hasn't worked at all, because there has been some progress in that, in that period of time. I probably wouldn't be standing here if it weren't for that model to some degree. Uh, but uh, it, there are still very troubling, persistent gaps in almost every aspect of 
of life from access to health care to access to good food environments to uh, achievement test scores to financing for school systems to the school to prison pipeline to um, you name it wealth accumulation segregation of communities these things are still uh, features of uh, American life so the model uh, hasn't worked completely we haven't been able to be completely identity blind and assimilation has proved difficult satis uh, and unsatisfying in some important ways, maybe even in some humane ways, that there are some ways in which it's not humane to expect people uh, to do that. So the model hasn't worked, and I also think, and this, this is where the psychologist starts to enter the picture, uh, I don't think it has fully appreciated some of the psychological challenges involved in uh, integrating like that or in assimilation like that. So I want to just spend a little bit of time detailing at least two of them. It's not that I think that's an exhaustive list, but it's the two that I'm most uh, familiar with. I'll say a little bit about them, and then I'll sort of get to what I think we need to do to kind of move on, to move from, as I've been calling it, diversity 1.0 to diversity 2.0, <laughs> uh, a, uh, a different era we need. Uh, well, I think one psychological challenge of diversity that we didn't fully appreciate is captured in uh, a, a phenomenon like stereotype threat, uh, a, a phenomenon that developed in our laboratory over the last uh, 20 plus years, I guess, at this point. Um, and uh, here's what it is. Stereotype threat is simply uh, being in a situation or doing something for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities, your age, your religion, your race, your gender, uh, is, is relevant to what you're doing in that situation. Then, implicitly, inherently, you know that you could be judged or treated in terms of that negative stereotype. And even that won't bother you unless what you're doing is important to you. If it's important to you, like your performance in school or your performance in your athletic performance or something of that sort, then the prospect of being judged or reduced to a negative stereotype about one of your identities uh, is upsetting and distracting and can affect your functioning right there in the immediate situation. And if you experience that over a long period of time in that area of life, it can make you want to avoid that area of life. Think about women going into STEM fields. It's, it's very close to your experience. Um, you know, the prospect of living your life in a field where you may be seen in terms of negative stereo stereotypes is kind of, uh, maybe there's some other place for me to be. I, it's not something that's welcoming. And it can, it can be a factor in uh, uh, the differential participation rates, the differential performance rates. This is kind of what the research has, uh, has, has focused on. Um, I'll just give you an example. I, I'll, I'll choose women in, in math because that's the very first uh, piece of research we ever did on this. Uh, so if, interestingly, after all these years, 25 years anyway, uh, it comes to mind <laughs> quickly. Uh, so um, a simple experiment. You have uh, women and men who are really good at math and really, really good at math. It's very important to them personally and to their careers. Uh, and, you, and they're equally skilled, these two groups you have, the men and the women. Same skills by all prior measures, tests, grades, everything. You bring them into the laboratory one at a time, you put them in a room, and you give them by themselves, and you, and you, you give them a very difficult math test, a half hour section of the graduate record exam. Uh, and that's the, it's the math section, not the, not the general quantitative section, but the math special section for the, of the GRE. Uh, our reasoning was that this would be, because of the nature of stereotypes, this would be a different experience for a woman than it would be for a man. For a man, they're going to go in, and we know, because we've set it up to make it happen, they're going to be frustrated. And they're going to worry, maybe, that they aren't as good at math as they thought they are. Uh, and that's going to trouble them. Did I invest in the right career path and so on? Uh, uh, but for a woman, there's going to be all of that anxiety and pressure in the situation. And there's going to be another one, which is that maybe this frustration I'm experiencing is a signal 
that, you know, I just don't belong in this business. This, I'm, I, maybe I'm confirming the stereotype in our society about women having less math ability. Uh, or um, if, if I'm not confirming it, then maybe it could be seen to confirm it, that the, the frustration of that experience becomes a signal which makes the stereotype about their group relevant to them personally and winds up being used in, interpret in interpreting their, their, their experience in this particular situation, their personal experience in this situation. Well, what you find is that you set that up, you know the men and the women have exactly the same level of math skill, but the women under that circumstance taking a very difficult test sort of at the frontier of their abilities, uh, it's important to them, they score a full standard deviation worse than the men. And the reason you know that it's stereotyped threat that is suppressing their performance, if you make that test unrelated to the stereotype, I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. But if you make it unrelated to the stereotype so that they're not at risk of confirming or being seen in terms of that stereotype, taking the same test, but there's nothing they could do to cause them to be seen in terms of that stereotype, you would, if stereotype threat is what's suppressing their performance, you would expect to see their performance of the women go up and match that of equally skilled men. That's the logic of this research. Um, here's how we get rid of the stereotype threat, we just say, look, you may have heard that women don't do as well as men on difficult standardized math tests. You might have heard that, but uh, that's not true for the test that you're taking today. The test you're taking today is a test on which women always do as well as men. There's just no group difference on this, on this test at all. They always have, they always will. Mm. So now you are back in that test room all by yourself taking the test feeling frustrated because it's a difficult test. Uh, you might worry, again, like the men, that you're not as good at math as you thought you would, but you wouldn't be under that pressure of confirming this, this alleged inability based on your identity, based on your group membership. That is gone. And when you take that out of the situation, you, what we find, invariably, women's math performance goes up to match that of equally skilled men. There's no difference between two. So that's the kind of evidence that gives you some sense that, uh, the, of, of this evidence of this phenomenon of stereotype threat, that it can, actually, it can actually visit a person right in the middle of taking a difficult and important test to themselves and affect their, their performance. And if there's something you can do to get rid of that uh, possibility, the relevance of that stereotype, there's, then there's no effect of identity on performance in that situation. Now, we've carefully matched them. So we've got men and women who are, uh, uh, by hook or crook, equally good at math. Uh, and the only thing that could, could, be, could be causing the difference is this stereotype threat. And when you take that out, there's no, there's no difference between the two. So that's the kind of evidence. You can do that with race. We immediately did it with IQ and race. Very same thing, you give, you give blacks um, and whites college students uh, the Ravens Progressive Matrices IQ test. It's a nonverbal IQ test. So you can represent that test as either, you can let people assume it's a test of intelligence, or they can uh, assume that it's uh, just a puzzle. You can tell them quite persuasively it's a puzzle. It's just a puzzle we're working on in the lab. Or you can let them, without saying anything, assume it's an IQ test. Well, when they're allowed to assume it's an IQ test, black students, college students, perform 15 points lower than do white college students, which is exactly the size of the uh, IQ difference between blacks and whites in the general population. One standard deviation, 15 IQ points. You tell them that the same test is not an IQ test, but it's a puzzle that has nothing to do with your intelligence. Just have fun with it. Uh, you know, when you, when you are working on a puzzle, you love frustration. That's what you want to do. And when it doesn't have anything to do with reflecting on your intelligence, blacks score the same on that test as do uh, whites. Well, 25 years later, probably 500 published papers on stereotype threat on every continent in the world looking at the effects of stereotype threat on one kind of performance or one kind of behavior or another. Uh, it's a reliable phenomenon. <laughs> it's a re I don't like it being a true phenomenon, but it is a true uh, phenomenon. It's a profound 
uh, phenomenon. Uh, we'll talk about it in relation to all kinds of things in addition to performance. One of the most tense and pressuring forms of stereotype threat is the stereotype threat that white Americans can feel in an interracial conversation about something related to race. It's a heavy one because any mistake that you might make, any possible insensitivity could result in you being seen or uh, in terms of that stereotype about your, uh, your racial identity that you're racist. And the prospect of being seen uh, as racist is just terrifying to people. Uh, and so one response to that kind of a, that form of stereotype is just to avoid those, those situations. Uh, and not have those kind of conversations and reinterpret everything in terms of something other than in terms of relevance to race and to just get away from it. Uh, one could ask quite rationally, is, which is more important in keeping us apart in the United States? Is it, is it actual prejudice or is it stereotype threat? Fear of, of uh, and, 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 and when we think about our, our learning institutions, our universities, our schools, which is the biggest factor? Maybe it's as much stereotype threat as it is anything else. We'll come back to that. But with, with these examples, I'm giving you like a, just a across-the-top view of what stereotype threat is. But the point I want to make is it happens when you, ha when you bring a diverse uh, a community uh, together. Uh, diversity is not some kind of just completely anodyne thing where uh, we're bringing together people who just differ in terms of slight differences in, in the shades of, of, of skin color, for example. And that's really all there is to it. And if we just make up our minds, we can just ignore that fact. No. We're bringing together people uh, from groups who have had profoundly different experiences in this society. Profoundly different experiences in this society. Uh, and we're trying to kind of make that uh, work. And uh, what I, uh, am, am the, the sort of uh, over theme of my talk is that when we think about diversity, we need to understand that reality. We need to address that reality. Ignoring it, uh, we're not going to be able to move forward. And I want to talk about what I think is important to address it in a, in a minute. But now I'm sort of outlining this notion. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think there's a certain reality to our society that we uh, have buffered ourselves from, which is that uh, it's impossible to be identity blind. We have used identity to engineer advantage in this society from the beginning and r ragingly right through the present moment. That's what I, I, you know, we, we, we interpret the problem as entirely a matter of, of prejudice, animus toward a group. I would put my money on a bigger source of this being just the use of identity to engineer my own personal advantage and my own advantage for my family and my people. I, I, and if I can use that and that's available, I'm going to do it. That's how the society got itself launched. I mean, if you go back to the 1500s, it was a fur trading world right here in Boston. The, the European ships would come up to the East Coast. Uh, the natives would bring furs and skins, give metal instruments, alcohol, and uh, textiles. Uh, that was a happy world. Well, I don't know, happy world, but it was a world where, where everybody was, you know, the native tribes were, were no different than the European tribes. The French, the English, the Swedish, the, the, the Powhatans, the Mohawks, they kind of, they all, and they would, they would coalesce with each other and war, war over things and, and so on. But then gradually as, as the Europeans uh, began to settle more permanently and to own land in particular, uh, that kind of changed. And pretty soon all those native tribes were seen as Indians. And they were seen to have a shared identity that they'd never thought they had. They'd never seen themselves as having anything like that bef before. And the indentured servants from, from Africa, that we created slavery. So indentured servitude moved in from being something you could buy your way out of to being something that was a permanent status and it was passed on to your children. And it was enforced rigorously. 
and that the social contract included uh, a, a group called whites, which was an amalgamation of, Europe, of, of, of Europeans. That's where the social contract uh, extended. And that kind of set off uh, a social structure, an identity-based social structure, which is probably still the foundation of, of American society. Now, in all fairness, America's been noble because there's been a lot of resistance to this. Uh, I can point to the Civil War. I can point to Reconstruction. But it's been a struggle. If I point to the Civil War and Reconstruction, then I have to also point to 120 years of Jim Crow, legalized segregation after that. Uh, there's Obama, there's Trump. <laughs> we struggle <laughs> in these ways. Um, and I, I think that's a, a better, more accurate way to, to think about it. I was just at the commemoration of Martin Luther King's assassination, 50-year commemoration, uh, last March. And I listened to four panels of civil rights lawyers uh, talking about one aspect of American life after the next. Uh, they're looking for the, answering the question, where should the focus of the civil rights movement move, move to? What it should have turned to at this point in time? And I mean, I, I just, I was, you, you, it was just put so depressing to go through a day of that, that every single aspect of American life, you know, probably beginning with school financing and, and uh, the connection between schooling and, and incarceration and, and the, the parallels that has with the, with, with the, with this, with the past. Uh, are, are just astonishing. So that race still is a profound um, um, source uh, uh, identity. Gender is still a profound uh, uh, way we organize our, our society. So if I'm a, if I'm a young uh, African-American student and I show up on a campus, uh, am I gonna, or in school, can I just completely forget that? Forget it? and just embrace the culture of the school and, and in order to wholeheartedly learn there and, ben and take advantage of its opportunities? Or will I have a certain amount of vigilance that is just an inherent part of the experience of being there? It's an inherent part of American life. Uh, it, it, it comes in part from a good thing, the actual attempt to have an integrated and, and fair society. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I am under, I, can I be just vigilant? There, there's a, a great uh, quote that comes from a, a, the, the acceptance speech of Kazuo Ishiguro, who just won, or last year, won the Nobel Prize for uh, Literature. And he's talking about the kinds of, of characters that he likes to write about. And he likes to write about people who are in this sort of historical vice of, uh, do I forget and go on and join the new world, Japan just after World War II? Do I forget or do I remember? He's got a great quote. Let me read it to you. Are there times when forgetting is the only way to stop cycles of violence and disintegration into chaos and war, forgetting? Um, or, on the other hand, can stable free nations really be built on a foundation of willful amnesia and frustrated justice? I think in some ways that captures in beautiful words uh, what, the, what, the, what the tension is. And as a psychologist, that's not just an abstraction. That describes the, the nature of psychological functioning in the immediate situation and how the, how the society and its history and its, 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 its continual organization affects the experience of being in an institution like, like we're in. So um, uh, I, I point to these things as a way of trying to pull out of the morass uh, what it is that is challenging about uh, a diverse society. Uh, I, I think the, the bottom line there, uh, and here I'm getting to what I think is the core uh, notion, is that it's just difficult to trust each other. It's just difficult to trust. Open-heartedly, unreservedly, unalloyedly, trust. We ha that has to be built. That can't be just assumed. If our society is homogeneous, uh, we're all pretty much the same kind of people, and we've got this status, and the education um, uh, 
infrastructure of our society is focused on educating a one particular group, then uh, uh, we're not going to have uh, identity as a as a wor as a, a, a something that might engender mistrust in the situation because everybody's got the same identity. So you can sort of put that whole question aside and get on with the business. And I can view education as primarily a matter of conveying you know, information and skills and broadening your perspective. I can, I can just go straight ahead at it because I've, I, the, the society is pretty homogeneous and, and, and for the most part uh, uh, all along uh, uh, our educational uh, system and infrastructure has been geared at, at educating really men of a certain class, certain race. That's what it's been. Uh, that's where, where we get all of our pedagogy, all of our uh, understanding from, is from that kind of a, of a history. But that, all, that, all that pedagogy that comes from that is now confronting a population that's increasingly diverse and, as I say, uh, seriously diverse. Not just superficially diverse, but deeply diverse. That may be a rub in American uh, society at this uh, point. I want to also say, as is part of the American tradition, uh, many, especially when you look on campuses, you try to understand where is this disruption and tension and so forth uh, coming from that we're experiencing almost at the level of the 1960s. Uh, I, I think a lot of white students are, are, are get this, or at least they do not want to be party to a continuation of using race and, and, as, and gender as a way of subjugating people. They don't want to be on the wrong side of history. And they don't trust the fact, they don't trust the older generation and the administrators and the, they, they, they don't trust the adults in the situation uh, because they haven't fixed it. They've talked about it, but there's just, they haven't fixed it. So how much can I continue uh, to, to, to trust them here? And I don't want to grow up and just put that mantle on. I want that to, I want that to be over with. So they join in with that mistrust of the institution, its leadership, its functioning, and, and the like. And then there are, of course, as we've seen vividly recently, um, there are others, you know, other whites that are going to feel like all the progress and attention given to, given to getting to dealing with race and as a source of, uh, of injustice, that, that's taking away from me. This is a zero-sum game. Who's representing my interest in this thing? What, 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 I, what, I just stand by? I didn't do anything. Why, why, am, I, why am I all of a sudden sidelined? So again, that, we're bringing all those people into a, a classroom or into uh, a school or a business, and we're trying to make, make it work uh, in, in some way, and we haven't been willing to d even describe what some of these tensions uh, are. But I, I want to argue that this is uh, the fundamental challenge of, I would like to say, having a broad reach. I'm most confident of higher education, which is the institution that I know the best, uh, saying that in higher education, uh, this is one of our fundamental challenges to make it work going forward. It's difficult to have uh, a generation of people that don't trust it um, and, and are impatient with its progress and with its lack of progress, and um, so on. So uh, what, uh, and, and as I just pointed out, uh, the pedagogy we have to offer the situation, the way we uh, set up our lecture courses, the way we do our advising of graduate students, uh, the way we set up student uh, study groups, uh, the tone we take in teaching uh, STEM fields and mathematics, the, uh, the, the same issues around the humanities and the social sciences. Are, 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 are we, uh, in, in doing all that, do we have a pedagogy which is really uh, able to deal with the challenges that, that I've just described or, or, or not? I was just talking to uh, a group of uh, law professors in the, in the, at Stanford Law School and they were just telling me about uh, um, they're what, what the first year looks like and you come in, you take some courses and the course, courses are all graded on a curve. That means only some people are going to get A's and some people are by definition going to get B's and C's and so on. There's no 
there's no uh, possibility that we can all get high grades. You, there's going to be, it's going to be on a curve. Uh, and the top of the curve are going to be the people who get the clerkships. And that's, the, that's what's offered out there. Now, if you get all boys who all come from r roughly comparable backgrounds, uh, a system like that might be trusted or at least might not be suspected on the basis of, of having uh, an identity bias to it. Uh, but when you bring in a diverse set of people who, again, come from a, a backgrounds that have had very different experiences in, uh, with the fairness of this society and with the role that identity plays in allocating advantage in this society, when you, when you bring that, when you're educating that group of students, uh, trust is a huge issue. So uh, I, I think it is a fundamental, profound source of the, of the troubles they're having. They're, they're struggling with, with uh, uh, precisely this, this uh, set of issues. But in diversity 1.0, we would never get so far as to thinking about how the actual curriculum is designed or how we actually think about coursework. That, that, would, be, that would just seem to be irrelevant. The basic offer of diversity 1.0 is, look, I'll be blind to your identity and you assimilate because I'm going to see you as an individual and that's all that matters in this situation. Trust me. Trust me, I'll do it. I know maybe it doesn't look so good, but let's forget about all that, right? Let's forget that. Trust me, I'm going to do this. Well, it, you'd have to be crazy if you're uh, an African American, a Native American, a Latinx. You'd have to be crazy to just take that. You, you're, a part of your brain is going to be vigilant to the fact that that may not be true. And there's just m mountains of evidence everywhere in society that just may not be true. So you're going to be a little pissed. Because people are talking to you about how they're blind and, and uh, fair and every, your individuality is going to be co coming through. But um, so that's our situation. OK, so what, I'm, what I want to argue, um, and, and I, I hope I, if I've depressed, I, I, this is the end of the depressing part of the talk. So we've, <laughs> we've gotten through the worst part. <laughs> now I'm going to try to be a little bit more encouraging. How do you deal with this? How, what does a diversity 2.0 look like? Uh, it, it is, a, it is a, an approach to the institution that looks at everything in terms of its ability to foster and develop trust. That has to be the first thing that we do in a diverse community, is to uh, actually take that on as an explicit part of what uh, is involved in pedagogy and is involved in teaching. Now, you know, there are a lot of teachers out here in the world. See, teachers are like amazing. I mean, they're, they're bad teachers, but they're just an unbelievable high number of really amazing teachers who know in their bones intuitively uh, that trust is everything, and they know how to do it. They know how to come in a classroom and behave in a way as to elicit trust. Uh, so uh, there are lots of examples uh, to be drawn from. I'm going to talk about three levels. One is what would what would what, how do you how do you get a a, a, a I'll put it in terms of concrete um, prototypes. You know how does a white faculty member engender trust? in interactions with students. That's one thing I'll talk about. Another one is uh, how, does, how do students maintain their own trust in a situation? How do you get through this? OK, maybe the deck has been rigged. But still, this is an opportunity that you've got in front of you. How do you uh, think about it in such a way as to be able to trust it? And then last, I want to talk about well, what does an institution do to sort of scale up these things into uh, and, and I'll give you research examples of, of these three. Then I'll, I'll stop and we can, we can talk about things. Um, how does a, um, uh, a um, well, there, there, there are two e e examples I want to um, give, two research examples. Uh, how, do you, how do you get people to be comfortable talking about identity? For all of the reasons that I just described, Americans hate talking about identity. They just hate the term. You say identity, it's like zzz, It just kind of <laughs> electrifies the room. People want to leave. Uh, and and uh, for all the reasons uh, I just described. So how do you get people comfortable doing that? Well, here's, here's, a, here's a study. We had white male 
undergraduates at Stanford come into the lab one at a time and expecting to have a conversation with two other students. They sit down, they see that the, their photographs of the two people they're going to have a conversation with, and for half of them, the two people are white, and for the other half, the two people are black. And then they find out that they're going to talk about either something easy to talk to anybody about, love and relationships, or they're going to talk about racial profiling. <laughs> so they're going to talk to either two white guys or two black guys about either love and relationship or racial profiling. Then the experimenter says, uh, look, um, I'm going to go down the hall and get your two conversation partners and bring them back. And uh, would, well, while I'm gone, would you arrange the three chairs here for the conversation? And you can begin to suspect that as soon as they arrange the three chairs for the conversation, the experiment's over. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. How do, you, how do they space themselves uh, for this? Uh, and you can predict what happens. When they're going to talk to two white guys about anything or two black guys about lo a love and relationships, the three chairs are very close together. But when they're going to talk to two black guys about who they don't know about racial profiling, they put the two black guys over here and they put themselves over here. They put a distance between themselves very reliably. And interestingly, we've also measured their level of prejudice before the experiment in another setting, implicitly and explicitly. These are Stanford students. There's not a huge, they're not highly prejudiced, but there's some variation in it. Who do you think in that critical condition, talking to two black guys about racial profiling, who puts their chairs the farthest away? The least prejudiced people or the most prejudiced people? The least. In stereotype threat experiments, who shows the biggest effect of uh, being under stereotype threat pressure? The women that are really good at math and, uh, and strongly identified with it, or the women that aren't so good at math and don't really care about it that much? It's the women who are really good at it. What makes you feel to be upset by the prospect of being negatively stereotyped is that you care about doing the thing that you're stereotyped as not being able to do. That's what's, that's what's upsetting. And in this case, uh, what they're, they're progressives, they're liberals. It would be terrible to go in this conversation with these two black guys and have them make some mistake, some unintended mistake, and be seen as a racist. And we know that that's exactly what they're thinking, because we have like Rorschach measures which, which pull down. What are you worried about? They're worried about us being seen in terms of uh, being seen as racist. Okay, here's the, the here's where we're getting closer to this trust building question. Uh, so that's what they're worried about. That's what's making it hard to trust this, this interaction, is, is the prospect of being seen this way. So how do you get them to have that conversation with two black guys about racial profiling and be comfortable, trust it? Well, it turned out after we tried many things that you might think of, uh, bias training didn't work, diversity training did not work, they made them, that made it slightly worse. Uh, <laughs> what finally worked was we said, look, nobody knows how to have these conversations, uh, really. This is American history visiting us, it's difficult. Nobody knows how to ha have these conversations. Um, just take this conversation as an opportunity to learn something. Just relax. It's a learning opportunity. Don't go in there and try to perform not being racist. Because that's going to be a hard little tightrope to walk. Don't do that. Ask questions. When you're in doubt, ask questions. Wow. When we did that, they, they, they were all over each other. The chairs moved really close together. There's a, a hopeful uh, 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 demonstration that there are approaches to dealing with this trust issue in a diverse uh, community. Another one, how does uh, a white professor give critical feedback to a black student on a piece of work? How do you do that? And have it be trusted. Well, you don't just, I'm going to spare you the details of the experiment, just give you the results. You don't just give them the feedback because they won't know whether the feedback is coming from the work itself or from how you feel about their group. They're in an inherent, their identity in America in that situation has them in an inherently ambiguous interpretive situation. Is it 
Me? Is it the work? Or is it how you feel about black people? What is it? I don't know. And because I don't know, I can't trust your feedback. Uh, don't uh, add to that some, some bromide, some soothing statement like, oh, uh, I, I, I remember your brother. I had him in my class. He was a wonderful guy. I really liked your whole family. That won't work either. That's just like a big fat signal that you were <laughs> of the wrong thing. What did work is when the person simply said, look, I've read your essay. Uh, I think it's got, I think it's, it's, you know, it could be a really good essay. It could be a good essay. And these, these things are designed to help you get better at it. I think you can be, I think you can write a good essay here. You got the beginnings of a good essay. And, and, and man, that was transformative. I, this is some of the biggest experimental effects I've ever gotten in my long career. Uh, of uh, almost all the black kids took that essay home and worked on. This was just an experiment. They they, they didn't have to do this at all, uh, but just to get that kind of feedback that I believe in you, I believe that this essay could be pretty good, and here's here's how you can make it better. Uh, if any of us get feed like, feedback like that from any of our teachers or professors, it can be transformative. It's, get, it's dealing with both things. It's, it's, it's signaling, I'm not seeing you through the lens of some negative stereotype about your group. I really believe this essay could be good. Uh, and uh, here's how you can make it better. And the students then just subtle, but again, uh, uh, a, a, a clear, concrete way to achieve and build trust. And it illustrates what I, I, I think our new pedagogies, our, div, our div, you know, diversity 2.0 has to do. We have to learn how to do this. Uh, if you're a student, how do you uh, maintain trust? I'm gonna focus here on na the narratives I have about this, me and the situation I'm in. Uh, think of me as a freshman at BU an African-American student, I've got a narrative going about where I'm at and what it means and what kind of place it is and, and so on. And that narrative could be uh, a really uh, dark narrative which says, uh, you know, behind every person is somebody who's really deeply racist because we're in America, man. That's the way it is. I could have that kind of narrative. Or I could have a narrative which is like on oh, the other end of the continuum, like false consciousness. We're in a completely post-racial world. I don't have to worry about that stuff anymore at all. That's over, man. Thank God. I wasn't born when I... <laughs> now, this, is the, this is the art of uh, a minority parent. How do you help your child have the right narrative for the situation that they're in? It could be easily tip into darkness, or it could easily tip into a supercilious, uh, ridiculous narrative. Um, well, we gave students uh, a narrative in a, I, I, I wish I could take credit for this, but these were my students in a very clever way. They had students at Yale, freshmen, uh, listen to a 25 minute videotape uh, from uh, depicting a student uh, at Yale who was 18 months ahead of the students who were seeing the videotape, the freshmen at, at Yale. White, white and black, see this videotape. And in that videotape, the guy says, look, I, when I came to Yale, I just, ha I, I, I hated it. I just, I, how could I ever fit in here? Even the gargoyles, it's such a Europhile place. Do they want me to be blonde? He says it's a, at a certain point. And, and he's, and then, but then I went home and my, my uh, father told me to come back and be, I, there's opportunity. And so my roommate and I, we become a, a singing group and then we get invited to some department colloquium and I went to the sociology department and I went to the biology department. And I, I had biology lecture, was one of the most beautiful lectures I've ever heard in my life. And, and I, I, I've taken three biology classes now, and I just love it. I think I found my life work. I, I really love this, this mission. And uh, it's the end of the video, Dave. Uh, it's a narrative. It doesn't deny anything about Yale and what could make a person uh, nervous uh, about how they're seen there and all that stuff. It, it acknowledges that. It says that's normal to feel that way. It's understandable that you feel that way. It's the opposite of saying, uh, just forget everything, man, and just love Yale. It doesn't say that. It says, you know, there's some real adaptations that we recognize are challenging 
uh, here. Uh, but there are other things here. And you're going to, you, you could quite possibly find something you would just really fall in love with here. So it is a realistic narrative with a very hopeful, concretely hopeful uh, story, trajectory to it. It's going somewhere. Uh, so when you give them that narrative, it's 25 minutes. Four years later, there's like no gap in their performance between uh, white students and, and the students who saw that, that uh, videotape at Yale. The students randomly assigned not to see it, there's a big gap. And that's a traditional thing. You look everywhere, it's called underperformance. It's almost lawful in American society. Negatively stereotyped groups show this underperformance. Uh, that is gone as a result of that. So it's a, a, a testament to how, and it's, an, it's another avenue into how you can build some trust in an environment and what a diversity 2.0 might, might look like. Uh, be careful about people's narratives and, the, and how we talk to them and get, lead them to understand things. Acknowledge, that this is basically a recipe from clinical psychology. You come in with a problem, doc, I got this horrible problem, I'm so anxious. And I, first thing the doc says is, well, let me pull off this book. Yeah, 60% of the population has that problem. Uh, so they, they normalize it right away, and you feel, really, 60%? I thought I was the only one that had this problem. So it's, it's a narrative that normalizes the, the, the tension of the situation. It recognizes where we are as a society, and then it offers this this hopeful uh, uh, outcome. Uh, we can talk more uh, ab about that. I think this narrative thing is really an extremely interesting um, avenue in to diversity 2.0. Last, scaling it up. At Berkeley, we did a survey of the physical sciences, and we wanted to see if women and minorities were making the steps they should make toward publication. You know, this is a, these are in graduates graduate programs there in the physical sciences. Um, um, as you well know, publication is the coin of the realm. And uh, that's everything is tied to that. Uh, and we wanted to see if women and minorities were doing as well as white males and Asian males at Berkeley in physics, math, astronomy, planetary and earth uh, sciences, and in chemistry. So we found that if you look at things like, you know, presentation at conferences and finished manuscripts and uh, uh, presentations in lab groups, all these things that are steps toward publication and then ultimately publication, if you look at all those things, indeed, the bad news you feared is true. In, in all of those departments, women and minorities were doing worse, substantially worse than men in all those uh, than, than ma white males and Asians in all of those fields, except in the College of Chemistry. And in the College of Chemistry, the women and the minorities are doing just as well as everybody else at a very high level. And it turns out that College of Chemistry has uh, produced, most of the American produced women chemists on, on ke uh, ke uh, faculty, chemistry faculty in, in the country, that one place. So what are they doing? Well, you, it doesn't take long to kind of see. Uh, they have uh, uh, two words I'd describe, H very high structure and very high responsiveness. So you show up for chemistry uh, in, in graduate school at Berkeley, they're gonna make you come three weeks early. You're gonna go through an orientation where the first thing they're gonna tell you is this is all about publication. That's a piece of cultural um, capital that maybe wouldn't be as distributed as you might think. I remember going to graduate school and kind of, well, I'm in graduate school, but what do we do here? And what, what, how does this work? And the, they, they, they remove the ambiguity. This is about publication. Coursework supports that, but it's, it's about you learning how to publish. We have set up for you interviews with six faculty and you're gonna s sample what they're doing, and they're gonna tell you about projects, and we want you to pick a project by the second week that school starts, and then we want you to have some data collected by Thanksgiving, and then we want you to have, th this is how you would move if you're gonna move through here at a pace that would deliver you to distinction in this field and to being attractive on the job market. So they tell them, they just remove all of the individual differences in, in, in that cultural capital that might exist without this kind of an, uh, a structure. 
uh, uh, they, they remove that. Everybody's on the, everybody knows what the deal is. And the other thing that they do, and I think this is probably the most important thing, is that the, they, they hold the faculty accountable to being responsive to the students. They hold the faculty accountable to that. So they have to have those meetings, and then they're, t they're interviewed about those meetings. Uh, so every student is very well kept track of. They kind of know where they're standing in this, uh, in this situation. There isn't that ambiguity about what does it mean, and why am I here, and why are we... Uh, all, that, the, the, all that ambiguity and uncertainty is, is like a, a, a ground. That, that's, that's where all that, that uh, anxiety and sense of threat has a chance to take hold of your psyche and begin to weight you down in the situation. That's where you start to see real differences between the women and the minorities in that situation. Uh, if you don't know where you stand and you really don't know exactly what, this, what you're supposed to be doing and you really don't know, have, a, have a good, clear relationship with, with the faculty advisor and you, all those things are up in the air, that, that's like a petri dish for anxiety and, and the identity and the American history is going to take that anxiety and expand it into a first rate, uh, probably depression and anxiety. In a, in a situation like, th like that, but, but certainly to interfere with productivity. So I, I don't think anybody in chemistry thought about this as a way of dealing with diversity, as a central strategy for diversity 2.0. I think they would go, what are you talking about? I, I said, no, we just do, this is the way we train our students. But it is a good example of what I think uh, we need to do, and it's a good example of an evolved pedagogy. We have a pedagogy which, in the same situation, at its pedagogy diversity 1.0, is you know, pretty much disinterest. I'm a lecturer. I hope you, hope you get what I'm offering you, but uh, you know, the, cream are gonna, the cream will rise. <laughs> My job is to just give you the information and see you. No, but you, when you've got somebody dealing with identity threat of the sort that I'm trying to describe, they need that, that, that thing, I think you can do this and here's how to do it. That, that it it's, it's not rocket science in the end, but it's knowing how central that is to a working with a diverse uh, student body that's, that's at, the, at the core of it. So uh, I, I, I'm about to... Uh, run out of time, so I, sh I should stop and let you guys have a chance to, to uh, 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 ask questions. But you can see where I, I'm going with this. I think the heart of the matter is, A, to recognize the difficulty of uh, the real challenges that American diversity holds for us. It's not some anodyne thing. It's just, in, in the standard model, we think of diversity as just something you do over here. It's a matter of conscience. It's a matter of self-presentation. I don't want to be, I want to be with the right cause, but actually, let me put my attention. That's the way we treat it. We marginalize it. We don't know how to, how to deal with it. We don't have any articulation of what the challenges uh, of it are, and we don't have strategies that know how to meet it. And, and th that's the major critique I want to make of, of, these, uh, of, of where we are and where we need to go. So thank you <laughs> for listening. probably worn you all out here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. So I have a question. In a world, and especially in the health-related fields, where we are so um, verbal uh, about our desire to recruit people who are otherwise underrepresented and have all of these programs where you get tagged as you come in because we are so zealous in our efforts. What kind of changes beyond what you've discussed do you need to introduce and how do you erase the, so the backlash of the progressive actions that are intended to be positive but actually really sort of solidify that identity and all of the stereotypes and the threat that go along with it in the student's mind? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, which is the backlash? I mean, the backlash is where you say, I'm here because of, because of this identity. They brought me here because there aren't any people like me here, and so I have to be here because they need me here, but that's the only reason that I am here. Oh, become, yeah, becomes a, uh, uh, an idea that 
that really leads me to mistrust the whole situation, uh, to regard the whole situation in a very, in a very cynical way. Uh, well, yes, uh, I think the things that I point to are critical to overcome that. Uh, I think that when somebody is interested in you and they try to really help you, you, you kind of don't have that cynical view. Uh, if you, you, I'm, I think about my own advisor and I'm, I'm, I'm writing about all these things and I'm probably overusing that example. Uh, but um, I felt that way. I felt all, all kinds of, when I went, first went to graduate school, I, 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 my personality was in lockdown. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, you know, he started to uh, pay attention to me. And he started taking me seriously. And he took the work seriously. I remember him telling me, you know, Claude, this is not a student project. This is science. We're doing science, okay? Like, get serious. I think you can do this, and this is what we're doing. That cleared a lot of air for me. And I think it's a way of cutting through the kind of thing you're describing. Uh, to actually have that experience, to have somebody treat you like that, respond to you like that, where they're taking you seriously, and, they're, and you're, you, you, we have the great advantage of, of sharing work together like that. Um, when, when people are genuinely interested in us, and they're really trying to help us, um, I think a lot of that suspicion about being used in the, the, the whole cynical framework uh, gets melted away. I've been trying to collect examples of, of friendships like that. I think we all have, or many of us have, intergroup friendships that work like that, it could give us some in intuition that that can work. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and John Wooden, his basketball coach, two very different human beings, couldn't be more different, uh, and have every reason to suspect each other. you just using me, blah, 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 blah. You, every, and, and as soon as a, 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 a team starts to go, have trouble, that's exactly the kind of ideation you have. I'm just being used and, 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 and so on. But, but Wooden was demanding, and I think you can do this, and I, here's how to do it. And you, you pretty soon you trust the guy. I don't need to know that he never had a, a, a racist view, because that's impossible in America. Everybody does. Everybody does. We just give that up. I don't mean to encourage it, <laughs> but I mean, we can't hold each other to, to that. We, our history is with us. But I want to know if I can trust you. Uh, there was uh, uh, an interview with the family of Emmett Till, who was so horridly murdered in the mid-60s. Uh, and they were asked, well, how do you think about the communities down here in the South, black and white? They said, more than race. We pay attention to who we can trust. In the, in the foxholes in Vietnam, more than race is who can I trust. And I think you show trust, you build trust through a genuinely supportive relationship, consistency, responsiveness. The, this, the, the, the basic formula is, is available uh, uh, to us, and I, I think it overcomes it. I don't think there's any other way I'm going to go uh, out on a limb. I don't think there's any other way to disentangle that, that source of anxiety. I think it has to be, this is a ground game of showing students, uh, since that's the institution we're talking about, showing students that they can count on this place, that this place is for them, that it's, gonna, it's going to really respond to their needs, it's going to listen to them. That's how you do it. Hi, so my question is more related to the uh, student perspective. So oftentimes when I think about the subject of uh, stereotype threat, the example that comes to mind is, you know, the underrepresented minority student who might be afraid or have some anxiety around um, seeking resources or um, other academic support for fear of looking like they are less than capable than their majority group counterparts. So in terms of sort of um, developing that trust and especially where it might not be sort of an individual relationship as it would be like with a faculty member but maybe in like a larger like classroom setting where um, a student for example doesn't want to be seen as you know kind of on the spot and you know sort of targeted um, mm -hmm. in that sort of experience what advice would you give yeah um, well uh, you know it, it's 
as a researcher, you tend to answer everything by going back to some piece of research. Uh, and the, the first piece of research that comes to mind is that one I described about, about narratives. Uh, I, I think we do have to be careful with our, our narratives, and we're often not as careful as we should be. We adopt sometimes a darker narrative because it feels good in the moment to have that narrative. And it's easy to get support for that narrative. Uh, uh, and so it's, it's like a piece of chocolate candy, man. It's really hard to um, turn that away and, you know, straighten up. And, so, <laughs> and it sounds so parental that, it, it, you know, it's, it's hard. But I, 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 I really do believe that um, uh, you, the, it, it's important to maintain as optimistic, and, and I don't know if I really want to use that, that term, as hopeful a narrative. As, as possible, I, one that, that empowers you in that situation. Uh, I think Obama's narratives were great examples of that, where he acknowledged the reality of racism and, and classism and economic distress. He acknowledged all that. He normalized it. We're all in this together. But uh, we can change this. We can, we can make uh, a difference here. Uh, and I, I think that is a, a, the kind of thinking about the situation. I, I mean, I, I'm 72 years old. I have to do that on, on a regular basis myself. Uh, and you have to sub find support for that. You want some social support, and you want some support in your, in your faculty, and you, you associate with people who, who can give you that uh, and who can, can support that, that, that kind of realism but with some... Uh, with, um, with some hopefulness uh, to it. Uh, and and I, think, I think you do stay, for, this is, I, I don't want to leave the wrong impression, uh, I think you do stay politically active because you know, we still do have a racial hierarchy and a class hierarchy and a gender. We still, do, we, we still need to be responsive at that level uh, too. But the combination is, I think there's a healthy combination in there where uh, we acknowledge that, we respond to that, so you feel good about it. You're not just being mowed over by racism. You're, you're, you're fighting it. You're resisting it. So that's going on. And at the same time, you want to you wanna be able to have a, have a beautiful life, a life that is uh, it, it, it's inspiring. And, and to find in the work and in the opportunities that which is inspiring. and Because it's that that's going to be necessary to keep you going and to sustain you and, and to make you a happy person. So anyway, I don't know, I'm making this up as I go along, but that's the best answer I can give. Please join it's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful.